campaign manager for the Opportunities Party. Um, I just introduced a couple of people, of course. I'll introduce Derek Love. Uh, this is Jeff Simmons, everybody, who uh, just recently stood at Mount Albert in the by election up there. So he got baptism by fire in Auckland. And so he's with us as well on this tour from the uh, bottom of the south all the way to the top north uh, over the next few months. Um, and Joe Morgan is here. Joe's wonderful uh, better half of Garrett is up the back there, who most of the time travels with Garrett for motorcycles around the world, but now she's in a bus and a truck with us, uh, just saying hello to people in all the towns as we uh, drive through them. And my name is Nick Tansley, my background is actually in uh, entertainment radio TV and a whole lot of other stuff, but um, I've got all out of all that stuff into the serious side of politics. <laughs> Very cool. Um, this is how it's going to run today. First of all, can I just thank you for coming out. When we decided to do these roadshow talks, the expectation was that we'd be happy with 10 or 20 people. Um, you know, well, 10 would have been fine. But uh, as also we proved it in Bacardi only two nights ago when about 150 came there. It's more here today, I believe. But we were just amazed at how um, the people came out just to give us a bit of their time, which was brilliant. Uh, the way the night will go is Gareth We'll uh, chat to you about um, uh, probably a couple of policies that relate to here more than any, and you'll get an idea of what Gareth was talking about. And then we'll go straight into Q and A. Uh, we like to get involvement from the crowd back to us, so that's how it's going to go. And I'm sort of that out, last thing I'll say, or two more things actually, is in questions I'll be helping to run that so that each person gets a chance to maybe ask a question. So um, you know if you. So I'll list this big, I'll ask them all, there is time to do that potentially after this night is finished. The only other thing I need to tell you is the toilets are out through the door at the back on the on my right or left. The exits have to be pointed out, which is one here, uh, one up the back over there, and one over there, near where Joe is, and the gathering point, should something happen, like another political party run in here and start shouting, will be over by the buses, apparently over just past the grass area. That's all I have to tell you. I'd like to now hand over to the leader, as Johnny says, he's also a very good friend, the leader of the Opportunities Party, Gareth Morgan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and then tonight, we're going to launch number six. Um, so this hasn't been spoken about before, and this is the climate change uh, policy. So Jeff um, will do that um, uh, once I've done this. And then we'll stop, and we'll put it over to you for Q&A, and we'll see how that rolls. Um, and I'll probably cover some of the other policies as we as the questions come at me. I think that's the best way to do it. And then at some stage I'll say I need a beer and that's the end of it. Um, and we'll adjourn to the pub over the other corner. <coughs> Alright, so firstly, why would anybody in their right mind do this? <coughs> I haven't actually got an answer. Um, except to say, you know, I have spent 35 years of my career working on economic and social policy in New Zealand, being part of advisory teams, being in the government and um, you know, the bureaucracy and so forth. It's an area that I obviously intensely interest me. Any of you who have read the motorcycle books or any of them will know that part of my interest when we go through some of these wacky countries is actually the political um, and social aspect to those countries and it's been an incredible experience doing that. You, know, you would never ever have learned that in a classroom, especially not in a country like North Korea, which you know, freaks most people out as soon as you mention them. So I'm in a pretty privileged position obviously having had that sort of exposure and we've done a whole series of research projects using amazing people who are experts in their fields to, to help us on this and a whole range of issues from climate change when we did Pole for Power, um, that book all the way through to the Treaty of Waitangi, and we've just done one on poverty in New Zealand called Penish from Heaven. And so, you know, it's really a way to bring all of that work together and say to New Zealand, look, these are the issues, it seems to us, the biggest issues. The solutions technically aren't actually that hard. Sure, there will be issues on the way through. But the real question here is, are you up to it? You know, does the objective justify the effort? Because there is an effort in all of these. There are no free lunches when it comes to policy. Now, most politicians will tell you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do whatever. They never tell you what the cost is. Everything has a cost. Okay, so you'll find through this year, as soon as politicians start rolling that sort of stuff out, I'll be at them straight away with yes, that's great. Now, can you tell me precisely which taxpayer is paying for this? So that we get, you know, a balance to these discussions. So that's really, so my worst scenario here is we go nowhere. Actually, it could be my best scenario. Um, and the polls, but at least we get the topics in the public discussion. So that's why I'm talking to you. Because it goes way back when uh, Michael Cohen was um, Shadow Minister of Finance, so this is before the Clark government, when I've done some work on this first policy and we went and presented it to the, uh, to the corpus actually the NAPS and then to Michael and Co. Went through it all. <coughs> yeah, so what do you think of that in terms of fixing the property market and you know, getting a fair tax system? He said, oh, brilliant. Fantastic. Right. Right. So you'll be doing it then. No chance in hell you know, that we will do this. And I said, why is that? So the people wouldn't understand from it. And I said, but if the people don't understand it, you've got to make them understand it, and then they'll support you if it's sensible. You know, people are incredibly rational once they have full information. The problem is most of us on most things get out of top information. It's getting worse actually with media. It's getting out a lot worse. And he just looked at me with that fly grin of this and said, that's your job. We just do it what they ask us to do. So are the words of career politicians. I'm afraid it's a reality that people don't like putting their jobs on the line. And so what they tend to do is as little as possible so that they can hold on to it. So that's the sort of downside of democracy. I'm not bagging democracy, don't get it wrong. Yes, don't get me wrong, I'm just saying it's not necessarily perfect all of the time. We have to keep working on it. And what we know in New Zealand is that the support for democracy in this country by the number of you that turn up in the polls 
this quite. It peaked in 1984, actually, when Robert Muldoon was at his worst. During that year, 92% of you came out in 84. We're now down to something like 76, 74. And it's a hell of a lot lower for the people under 50. So democracy is struggling here, and it's the same in much of the world, actually. Um, so that's what we've got to work on, and that's what one of the goals of this process is. All right, so let's do the first policy, and then we'll hand over to Jeff, and he can do the climate change switch. Okay, so the first policy is all about, um, well, it's making New Zealand fair. The problem is this. Not all forms of income are taxed. There's a massive loophole in our tax system that was born in 1984 by one Roger Douglas. And as a result of that loophole, unfortunately, you have been rational, I have been rational, <coughs> we have responded, and we have invested money on the back of the tax advantage, not on the back of the advantage to New Zealand as a whole. And that's always a golden policy that the individual's behaviour has to be in sync with the objectives of society, otherwise you have a problem coming. And that problem now has been going for what that is, um, 20 something, 30 years. So it's a long time. Of course, what I'm talking about there is the tax loophole that means the owners of assets do not pay their share of tax. The corollary of that is that salary of wage earners pay far too much of the tax bill, far too much in this country. So I look at that and I think, well, we've got to correct this. So how's the way to do this without the roof caving in? That's the main thing. Because the longer this has gone on, the harder the adjustment potentially could be. And we've seen the adjustment in Ireland and in Spain with the house prices over there, and it hasn't been pretty, 24% unemployment day day. So we don't want that. We need to try and engineer a, an orderly adjustment to this. So here's the policy. I'll give you the good news first, because I don't want you walking out before I give this here. <laughs> the good news is, on average, and we'll all be all over this, but, but this is the average for the New Zealand table. On average, you take 8% of your gross salary, and you put it in your pocket, because that will be the tax cut. Okay, so it's a 30% drop in tax rates. The average tax rate is about 24, so it's 8% of your income. That's the good news. The bad news is you take 1.5% of the value of the equity in your assets. So add up all your assets, take off your debt, 1.5% of that, that's what you get taxed each and every year. You don't have capital gains tax. This is a tax. Think, you can think of it as not one of these, but it's sort of crude. This is what they call it in Europe. You can think of it as a wealth tax. And it's probably the simplest way to think about it. Now, when you do that arithmetic for New Zealand, what you find is you get 80% of people are better off. That's how skewed this is. 20% of us, I was going to say worse off, but that's because I'd say, we'll be investing in the future of the country. political <laughs> But don't cry for us. We are the richest. 20%. Now there's quite clearly an age bias here because the longer you have gone through life, the more chance you had to build assets. So on the face of this, looks, this looks very unfair on the older folks, which I have classified myself as. But I feel it, but I am apparently one of these now. So what we do in that sense for them is we say, we're not going to not have the tax, but you will have no cash flow implications. So for you, we bundle it up. So think of it as an estate duty. Okay, so it's one and a half percent a year, and you go to 10 years, um, that's what, 15? So it's a 15% of state duty. State duty in the US is 40. I don't cry. Right, it could be a lot worse. Um, go to 20, then it's obviously 30%. But then you have no tax. There's no, sorry, no cash. 
um, applications. But you do have a bill to the IRD, and they're a crack of a creditor, I can tell you. <laughs> so they will get one way or another their funding. So it is, has got intergenerational implications. But just remember the number, 8-0% of people are better off. Now what this is, will effectively do is you've had house prices doing this, right? Just boom. Not just since we had immigration, by the way, that's a red hearing. Just adds to the face of it, a bunch of that. But if this has been going since 84, when they liberalised the, the market. And the population's only doing this. So in other words, the growth in the house prices is more than inflation, more than population, on a per capita basis. It's Right, the growth of the house, uh, the growth of the house prices. Meanwhile, the income has been doing this. So when Jane and I bought our first house in '74, the average house in New Zealand was uh, cost three times the average income. It is now eight times, and in Auckland it's eleven times. This is why you have families with the two people out there working and two or three jobs each, just to pay the minimum rent. There is an issue here, there's a problem here. And when we look at the graphs of this stuff, inequality has been growing in New Zealand. And that's not the New Zealand that I want to see. I don't mind inequality when it's due to merit, but when it's unearned inequality because of a, you know, a privilege in the tax system, we have an issue. So what this will do is if all house prices have done that, we would manage it. So we wouldn't bring what I said to you, 8% in your pocket and 1.5% out of it before we've got the assets. We wouldn't do that overnight. <coughs> We'd do it over time, determined by what happens to house prices. What we want to do is hold now house prices while incomes have time to catch up. So we can bring that house price to income ratio back down to something like whatever, 4 5, instead of the same. Because what's happening now, I'm concerned that my grandkids won't be able to afford the rent, let alone buy a house. This is a very significant distortion in our capital markets that we have underlined, underlined by, you know, by this tax privilege. Most countries in the world, how they deal with this, there's a whole range of ways of doing it. One's capital gains tax, which doesn't work for a number of reasons. The main reason is it's not levied until you sell, so what do you do? You don't sell it. So it distorts the economic decisions, which is not what you want. Another is property tax itself, which is the sort of thing we are talking about. Another is stamp duty, another is estate duty, and so on and so forth. But those taxes that all come at the end of life, you don't even start thinking about them until you're about to cut. So they don't actually affect your decisions until right near the end. So they're very distorted. Whereas the way we're going to affect your decision right today, because you know if you build assets, um, that they have to pay their share of tax. Okay, so that is policy what? It is radical. It will have a huge impact in New Zealand on the affordability of housing. It will bring that back in. And basically the price of housing will now reflect the value of a roof over your head. If you want to flash a roof from the next guy, fine. That's still your choice. Whereas at the moment, I have six houses in New Zealand. I have no tenants. They just make the carpets do. I do it because I know you are going to bid the value of those houses up. And I've been proved right year after year after year. Despite the fact that I was a promise doing this stuff, I go out in the circuit and say, shouldn't be doing this. By well, another one, Joanne Shaw. <laughs> and then we're all doing this. And it's causing unbelievable dis distortion. Think of the land banking that's going on here, where people ring fence the city, these guys, by buying the land. And just wait for you to bid the price up, wait for the pressure, the pressure to build, and then pop it very much. So the distortions to the functioning of this economy are enormous. Talk to any business person and ask them how difficult it is to raise money for their business, whether it's a corner dairy or whether it's a sort of long you know, um, conglomerate thing. Those markets are really difficult to tap for those businesses because the banks are told that 
that more meters are the only safe, or the safest things to lend on. So give them the cheapest rates. I've been hammering at the Reserve Bank for years on this. If you keep doing that, the public will make sure that at the end of the day you're wrong and housing won't be safe. So most economists in New Zealand are calling for a 40% fall in house prices. That would be ridiculous if that came true. We have to hit it off in the past. And that's what I'm what's what we've got here. It's basically an ordinary fashion. So that, that policy can only get phased in to the extent that those house prices prices level off, not fall. But otherwise then we've got to deal with all sorts of problems on the other side of the balance sheet, which is the debt that New Zealand owns over, overseas because all of this, these house prices you've got are matched by mortgages through the banks to foreigners. You haven't got the money to do that from me. I've been making deposits. You've been getting it through your friendly Australian banks from foreigners. So New Zealand private foreign debt is very high. Keep pushing and then you get a repeat of the mold debt private, don't you? Where you run out of money and more help access. So the choice is yours. All I'm doing here is pointing out the problem and the solution. So that's the first bit of good news. Right? All the policies are just radical. Um, so now we're going to talk about one more policy and then we'll give you a chance to hammer us. So Jeff's going to do um, the launch actually of our climate and policy. We've already done our environmental policy, I think that's one third of all. Um, and the environmental policy is quite intertwined with the climate change policy. There's the difference, but they do work in tandem. We've done that deliberately. So the fresh water one's already been done. Um, but you're now to the climate side of that equation. Jeff. Yeah. Kia ora. I'll just give you stuff in the ground, of course, for coming out. How cool is it?
down the back alleyway of carbon credits, buying off forests, the Ukrainian you know, back, back alley salesperson. We were the only ones there. And per capita, we have gorged on those fraudulent foreign credits more than any other country in the world. Okay? So it's an absolute disgrace how we have met our international <coughs> commitments. And it's not been because we've done anything, because we haven't done anything. So that's the background. Now we have signed up to the Paris Agreement, and the implication of that, if you, uh, you know, looking at the consensus on the, on the science, is that we have to get to zero carbon by 2050. Okay? We'll put agriculture to one side for a moment because that is more difficult and it is a different case. But we have to get off fossil fuels by 2050. Net zero carbon. Okay, so that means if we have to use a little bit of fossil fuels in 2050, that's okay as long as we're planting trees or sucking that carbon out of the atmosphere somehow. But we have to get off this fossil fuel addiction by 2050. That's the bottom line. And the government, again, has no plan to do that. There is no plan. So like I said, we're, we're, we're here, we've got to get to here by 2030, and basically we have to get all the way down here by 2050, and we're up here. So we need a plan for action, and it's got to be fast. So here's the top plan, very briefly. Uh, you can find more detail on our website top.org.nz forward slash top six. It's our sixth policy. Logical and nothing else. Okay. First up, we've got to restore the integrity of the, ET, of the emissions trading scheme. The emissions trading scheme is the number one tool that we, that we have as a country to achieve our targets. Okay. Now, I'm happy to talk more about the emissions trading scheme if you, if you have questions about it. It isn't a simple thing, that's fair, but the point is we put a decent price on the, on the emission of carbon. Okay, we get a good price on it, and it'll give people an incentive to reduce emissions, or give people a good incentive to plant trees, or find other ways of taking emissions out of the atmosphere. So we have to restore the integrity of the emissions trading scheme. The way we do that is by dumping those junk credits we bought in the first place, number one. Number two, we stay close to international trade until we know it's a, a decent situation. And we think the emissions trading scheme should, be, should stay closed indefinitely. And if we have to trade internationally to buy our way out of, out of our targets, the government should do it. I must say, he means trade of carbon. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We need a Zero Carbon Act, just like the UK has, to make sure that we have a plan ongoingly. Each year, the government in the UK gets a, a report card. How you've done on carbon this year, Tony? Or it's done. Teresa, doesn't it? Teresa, here's, here's how you've done on carbon this year, Teresa. Got an A here, a B here, whatever. And so the government is keeping to account in that way. The upshot of what we're talking about is that the carbon price will rise. We'll get rid of the ceiling on carbon and you'll see it rise significantly in coming years. It's hard to know how much because it depends how many trees get planted. But we want to have a go at meeting our climate change commitments within our own country through our own actions first. Rather than sending money offshore, overseas, when we've been giving it to criminals in the past. How are we going to use the revenue that that will generate? Because of course the government will sell carbon credits and will generate revenue. So there's two ways that we will spend this money. And these are, by the way, both things that we should be doing anyway. Okay? So the first thing is energy efficiency. New Zealand is terrible at energy efficiency, even though it would save us money. It would make us money. It would save our power bills in our homes and would cut costs for businesses. There is money lying around on the ground, but we don't do it. Why? 
Come on, you guys have got Scottish ancestry. You should know us because we're tight. All right? Kiwis are tight. We don't like the upfront costs to save us money a few years down the line. So we're going to plough this money into. Did anyone, did anyone get involved in the Warm Up New Zealand scheme where you got home insulation? Some people got that? Yeah? So think of that on steroids. But for homes and for businesses, small businesses, helping them all become more efficient, use their energy more efficiently, save money and cut their carbon emissions at the same time. This is exactly what the business Green Growth Group suggested back in 2011 and the government said, nah. Okay, so there is huge amounts of money that we can actually make here. We can make our country more prosperous and cut emissions at the same time. <laughs> the other big thing is planting erosion-prone land. New Zealand has 1.1 million hectares. That's 5% of the country of erosion-prone land. It's not making much money from the sheep and beef. Every time you cut down a tree that's on it, the soil ends up in the, in the rivers and in the ocean. Yeah, we're, we're, we're losing soil, we're stuffing our rivers, when actually all this land should just have forest on it. Forest on it that could be earning us carbon credits, saving the soil, and saving our water at the same time. We should be doing it regardless, but we're not. So that's the other major area that we'll invest in. We, the other thing that we have to do is make sure that our long-term investments make sense because some investments we make now will be still around past 2050, okay? So we have to make sure our homes are more energy efficient because they're getting built now and they'll be around post 2050. We have to put funding for transport on an equal playing field between trains, shipping and cars. At the moment, all of the money goes into cars, and we're not saying necessarily more should go into trains and shipping, but that when these decisions are made, we should be looking at each on its merits and putting the money where it makes the most economic sense. Now, we haven't talked about much about agriculture, and like I said, that is mostly taken care of in our water policy, which is incredibly stringent, and we're happy to talk about that later on. That's the first stage for improving agriculture. But all the stuff that we have proposed under our agricultural <coughs> policy, under our fresh water policy, will actually reduce carbon emissions in agriculture anyway. And the last point is on this adaptation. And this is the real reason that we are releasing this policy in Dunedin. Because you guys, South Dunedin in particular, is at the, the forefront of the challenges of sea level rise. Okay, now the Parliamentary Commissioner, Rick, his Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, has worked out that there are 9,000 homes that are in th that are at threat <coughs> before 2050 in New Zealand. That's a Christchurch-sized red zone, right? That is a disaster waiting to happen that is completely predictable. And we're not all talking about million dollar beachfront batches that we can just sort of say, oh, you know, don't worry about the rich price. We are talking about, in the case of South Dunedin, we are talking about people's only asset. And that's, South Dunedin is probably the, the one of the areas that's most at risk in the next few decades. What we're suggesting at the Opportunities Party is that the government needs to be at the table with local authorities and local communities working out the solutions what's going to be the plan of action in these areas. Because otherwise, we're just going to wait until the disaster happens, and what will happen then? Well, just like what happened in Christchurch, the government will swoop in and help everyone. So let's admit that we're going to be doing that anyway, and get in there and start having those conversations now to try and prevent these disasters before they actually happen. That's our climate change policy. So, so that's all the lecturing. We now want to hear from you guys, your thoughts and questions. And Gareth and I are here to answer on those two or on any of our policy areas. Right, so just to remind you, uh, this is, uh, we did this in the Chicago and we did cause a riot. It was fantastic. Uh, that is, a 
Gareth uh, will probably pick you, um, and he'll, he'll try and go right around the room. If we can ask you just a, a fairly quick question, um, and can we just say question? We had a few people decided they were going to give us a statement. We won't have time for that tonight, please. So questions are great, and then Gareth or Jeff will answer them appropriately. Thanks very much. We keep to that. We'll get through quite a few. And just before we start, those of you who have got the brochure or um, have a read it, the policy areas that I gave you, the first one, which is tax and uh, tax reform. Um, the second one, which I remember, you should be able to tell me about the brochure, was immigration. So these are the areas that we, look, we're not trying to be the government here. What we're trying to do is say that these seven areas, we actually know what we're talking about. And there's a lot of evidence-based stuff here. These are the areas we think that will make the most improvement in New Zealand's lives if we get on and start doing stuff. So, you know, we're not pretending to be experts at everything, which you don't have to be if you're not wanting to be the, you know, the government itself. So, immigration. Is the next one environment, which Jeff talked about, and all of this policy, by the way, is fiscally neutral for the accountants of the room. What does that mean? That means that everyone that costs money, I can tell you where the revenue is coming from. <coughs> and that's not just down on that. So let's take environment, because environment does actually dovetail into what Jeff talked about. It's the same sort of principle. And let's talk about a dairy farm and a catchment. And we're saying, hey, we want less nitrate leaching the sub-catchment that we're getting at the moment. So the, so the community, through whatever mechanism, um, together with the, local, the regional council and maybe the directive from government, says, right, well here's, for this sub-catchment, here's the acceptable amount per hectare of leaching, of nitrate leaching, of nitrate leaching. Every farm that is leaching on a per hectare basis above that pays money. In economics, it's called a corrective tax. Okay, so they pay for that. Every farm that is leaching below that acceptable level or tolerated level gets that money. It's completely closed fiscally. Okay, it's completely closed in the industry and in the area and the subcatchment. What are you doing? You're encouraging environmentally um, harmonious farming and discouraging the other. And it would be the same, if we're not just talking about farming, it will be the same type of mechanisms with urban areas as well. Okay. So that's the sort of general principle we use, corrective taxes, and they will all be based um, back in. Just so they've got that sort of idea. So that was what policy uh, was it? Three. Three. Um, four is, I, I mentioned before, about the concerns we have about the deterioration of democracy in this country and the lack of engagement, particularly with the under 50s. Um, and that really concerns me because that's the sort of thing that happened in America. And they did do their so-called radical adjustments. They get, just kept cruising on doing nothing. And they got an extreme reaction, which is yet to play out. So we're trying to get this sort of stuff off of the parts, not wait for it to hit us in, in the face. The fifth one was education. Education policy is quite radical. It's got a, a lot of investment in early education, okay, um, which we can talk about if that's your thing. Six one is just done. And the seventh one, just to finish this week, um, is as radical as the first one. Now, it doesn't get announced actually until next Tuesday in Christchurch, but essentially what it deals with is the UBI. Everybody know what that is? An unconditional basic income which we feel has got to be, it's going to come. That's a question of how do we move to us and how the hell do we fund that, That's the big issue with the UBI. So it's the start of the UBI um, policy. And we will start with the UBI for the very young, or, or parents for the very young, under five. Uh, under, under five. And um, with the elderly as well. And we'll just move in as we do more and more tax reform. But UBI is quite important because in this day and age of casualised work, where jobs come and go, and you need lifetime learning, that's education um, policy, that you need life, there's no good having all your um, education crammed into the first years of that old, but that's what not going to do you any good because it will be with, uh, with word, um, obsolete, um, you know, within the next sort of cycle um, of technology. So that whole tertiary system has to change changed quite radically. What they've done in Singapore is they've given people vouchers um, for their tertiary education that they can use 
at any time during their adult life when they need it. So you combine that with a UBI that's punching you through the unemployment times, that's the idea, right? and you, you're building resilience in your population to these inevitable cycles that we're, we're on. So that last policy is actually quite exciting. So that's our sort of gambit. So if you ask us a question outside of that, we'll probably go, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, don't disappoint yourself. <laughs> Cool, so we'll be good. Um, Gareth, I was just going to ask too, if you can leave your talk and stand here so they can see you, because I just noticed that you're talking in the dark. But, not literally, but um, that's it, just there when you're talking, that'd be great. Okay, let's get another one. So you first, you didn't have a hand up, is that cool? And, and Gareth will repeat the question. Yeah, so you're here at the back. Thanks for the climate change policy. I wanted to just add a little bit, or explain a little First of all, is there any room to transition to a carbon tax in the long term? Secondly, do you have a scheme for including agriculture? What time frame for that? Are you going to look at reinvesting money, not just in insulation, but in four generations? That income that shifting is an important part of the climate policy. And finally, we have policies for basic transport funding in 2008. We've got a total back to you. Are you going to do a fundamental rebound and go back to the foundation for the transport funding? Okay, I'll try and remember all those things. Yeah, uh, okay, last one, please. Absolutely, we want, to, we want to pretend to mode neutral infrastructure funding of renewables. Okay, so road, rail, shipping, equal, equal basis. That was the first one. I'm not going to test it. What was the third one? <laughs> About the choice of investing in insulation or investing in future generations. Oh, look, the, 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 yeah, no, I mean, insulation is just an example of what I'm talking about, right? It's the most obvious example that people can talk about. Let me talk, tell you about um, the, this, what we're proposing. You know, um, I ran a similar scheme in the, in the UK, and they did things like, they helped one business, uh, a food business, cut their power bills and fuel bills by half simply by fixing the seals on their refrigerators, right? This stuff, you know, the, the, the ways of improving energy efficiency are many and varied and, uh, and you know, you can, you can find incredible, incredible savings in the simplest of places that businesses overlook simply because they just don't know. They don't know to check that. So absolutely, it's not just insulation, it's, it's you know, right across all forms of energy efficiency. It might even be helping uh, an organisation you know, run its fleet in a more efficient fashion. You know? So the second one was um, how you would say agriculture. Oh yes, so agriculture. So what we are saying, so what Gareth described um, is, is our you know, fresh water policy. That, that is going to be, that's the most, uh, Know, the, the place that we start, okay? <coughs> now we predict that phasing that in will reduce the overall dairy herd, okay? Because, uh, because it will give an incentive for less intensive agriculture. Now I can wax on about this for, a, for quite a long time, but basically there are a lot of farmers now that are finding that by having a few fewer cows and using less inputs, they can have the same profit, have the same amount of milk, uh, sometimes even more profit, and far less environmental damage. Okay? So we want to incentivize farmers to move to that stage. You'll see fewer dairy cows, fewer pollution, and you'll get the climate benefits of that at the same time. Okay? Then we want to uh, integrate, because we don't want farmers to have to deal with one bit of paper over here and one bit of paper over here, but we then want to integrate the climate into that that system as well, okay? But more research is needed on uh, methane, more research is needed on soil carbon, uh, and, you know, what, it's looking very promising, but, you know, there will, there will be, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that in the next couple of decades we will be able to have pasture-based farming that actually is net carbon neutral, simply because it's actually you know, treating the soil right and actually building up soil carbon. Uh, what was the first one? 
that was really um, the easiest and long term to carbon tax. To carbon tax, yes. Uh, I mean, we do not plan to move to a carbon tax because um, because we want to see if an ETS is designed right, it can do the job. And the price of carbon will reflect how hard it is <laughs> to reduce emissions. Okay, so we will see, you know, uh, we will see the price of carbon rise above what it is now, and potentially well above what anyone is suggesting with a carbon tax. Um, the trouble with a carbon tax is that it doesn't incentivise. Uh, ways of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere in quite the same way, forestry in particular. Uh, so that's our major concern with that. Um, and so we think a, a well-managed emissions trading scheme can do the job better, actually. Okay, so that's four questions from him, so I don't want to hear from him again. <laughs> <laughs> Except at the pub after. Yeah. Alright, hands up. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. What are we going to do?
to change all road vehicles to electric cars? And if so, how do you plan to convince or incentivize people to do that? Right. Yeah, so the question was, uh, by 2050, do you plan to change all road vehicles to electric? And if so, how do you plan to do that? Um, and the answer is uh, yes, absolutely. Um, how do you, how do we plan to do that? Well, our our plan is very much focused on the lowest hanging fruit. Okay, so we want to do the stuff in the first few years that we should have been doing ten years ago. Okay, so all of this energy efficiency stuff, all of this planting erosion framework, this is urgent stuff that we should have got done a decade ago and we need to do right now. Okay, the, the shifting more stuff to public transport, as I discussed, that's a, a major part of that transport shift. Now, our view is that in about, uh, well, first up, we want the public sector to be buying electric vehicles only such that in about five years' time, you'll start to get a used car market, because Kiwis don't buy new cars. We're tight, remember? We discuss this. Yeah, so we want to we start by building the, the used car market, and then, in about, we think in about five years' time, EVs will start getting to the price point where they are close enough that, with, it, with some simple incentives and a decent price on carbon, they're actually going to be Okay, so yes, but it's not number one priority. Okay, it's, that's that's the job that we do in five years when we've done all the stuff that will actually make us money. Yeah, and so do the cheapest things first, and it's a similar argument to that. Like the same type of thing, just because just look at the cost of those, look at the price of those. It's going like this. So you know, don't. Don't go waste money, go go for three years too early. But it's definitely there. And you know, you've got to do this stuff. You will never get your car to Jackson by 2050. So we know that, but let's get the low cost, what he calls low hanging fruit first. I mean, haven't even done that? There is no there is no strategy at the moment. It's it's like, you know, New Zealand Super that was announced yesterday. Yes, we'll change it, but we're waiting for Gareth to be 76. <laughs> <laughs> Murray had settled for one and a half cents on the dollar. 
Okay, that's the treasury working summer, which in other words means Murray has been magnanimous in this. So that's the two-way street when you have a treaty between the signatories. You look after each other, you have a duty of care <coughs> to each other. So when we look at the treaty, basically the three causes. The first is that Parliament is sovereign. Now I know Mark already saying, well, we didn't bloody sign it. Um, so, you know, we didn't see sovereignty for the treaty, which is correct, and the tribunal has. Said, no, that's right, it's still said it, but he that's the British law and order system, right, which is another way to see. So, so that's a discussion off to the side. It's a distraction. Parliament is sovereign. Third article is easy as well. You and I, as New Zealanders, have individuals now I'm talking about, have equal rights. That means equal political rights. Both causes are easy. Here's the tricky one. Article 2. Is the carve out for Maori society, which means if we didn't, as Maori society, freely sell assets to you <coughs> at a fair price, whatever, you know, agreed by us, sell it, not with a gun to our heads, then they're ours. Now that's what the article says, and that's what is accepted now more and more in New Zealand law. That's why the regional councils, you know, have to take account of the treaty and everything they do, because they're very much involved in natural, natural assets. But now let's come to water. Murray had a claim on water. There was no doubt about it. And so John Key, I remember when he said to me, we can't pay charges for water here. And so because as soon as we charge for water, we put a price on it. Bingo. Murray will have us in court and say, right, this is our slice. So what he tried to do is charge for all the uses around water, the ancillary costs of getting to the water access to the river, da -da 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 -da, nothing but, but not charged for the water. Now this is a major problem for us because if we are stuffing our rivers. And so we want to see as a party all users, including the dams, paying for the water. So in other words, you have a waterway that must start off as swimmable and it must have the ecological bottom line met. So we're very, very similar to the Greens here. It's just the difference between us is where policy makes it work. <laughs> Right. And we don't want to stuff our economy. So you start with the water that must run to the sea to maintain the ecosystem. This is another reason why in our constitution I want um, the rights of the uh, endemic ecosystems to have um, constitutional rights. So you cannot take them out, which is they're now going in equal order in the living world. So the, the water must flow to the sea. So there's a minimal flow, which all you know, scientists and that will work out, and then above that you have um, customary access, which will be the Maori thing, and then as well as that you have your right to have that fresh water out of, drink that fresh water out of the space beer tank down the, down the road there. Everything open above that is commercial ground. Whether it's taken by Ewe corporations, or whatever they're doing with irrigation schemes, or whether they're taken by a dam, or whether they're taken it's commercial. So therefore you have to have a way to allocate it. And the way to allocate it is price. Now let's not do what we did with the QMS for the fishing. Which is what we, where we gave overnight a windfall capital value to the people who own quota. That was the most stupid thing to do. And that, that's because it's the commons. It's a public good for the sake. And then of course they were like, oh God, you know, and the supply of fish isn't it? Oh, we'll bring in a we'll bring in a total available catch, so we'll ration them. But you've still got this problem that the, the fish stocks in New Zealand are actually owned by private corporations now, not clever. So we don't want to repeat that with the water. But the water is the property of New Zealand and of New Zealanders, and it's the most valuable resource on it. So the answer, to that, I'm long out, I'm sorry, but the answer to your question is we would definitely be judged for through that mechanism. No, we have to face up to the fact that Murray have a claim on the <coughs> Now, if Murray's track record is anything to go by, it's about mana for no, It's about honouring the fact that Article 2, which we all sign, says that, you know, natural resources are taken on the law of Murray. And they have, to, they have a right to have it protected. 
So I think that's a one, there's a one one in there, absolutely. And we, the sooner we get on with it, the better, because look what's happening to our women. Terrible. Right, sir. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. Uh, uh, all of the comments here, all of our things on Facebook. But uh, um, I've got lots of questions. I feel sorry if you're doing that. Yeah, no, no, lot, lots of um, questions, but I'll just ask one, really. It's, um, uh, because I think it's related to uh, one of the biggest problems in New Zealand, I think, is just the levels, problem growing levels of debt. Um, they, they tend to uh, make people, you know, just hunker down and forget what's going on with democracy, etc. Et so uh, your one and a half percent tax thing on the equity, now doesn't that, isn't that just kind of um, encouraging people to keep on piling on the debt? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, there's sort of two questions in there, but the concern is if you have one and a half percent on the equity version of your assets, well, I'm just going to borrow all the money. That's fine. I don't actually care because the debt, as long as it's done at arm's length commercial basis, has already got a tax collected on it. <coughs> so when I talk about that one and a half percent, I'm not including in it the assets.
So the answer to the first question is absolutely what we're talking about is moving transport investments to mode neutral, which means that we treat roads and trains and shipping at all the same. Okay? Uh, so they're all full cost of recovery. That's what he means when he says treat them the same. So if you've got trucks on the road, they have to pay not just for the wear and tear of the, 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 that tonnage causes, but also for the cost to you of the congestion and the delays and the delay. So all of that work has to be done in order to get a cost neutral. Um, you know, it's indifference between the different modes. But definitely bringing congestion charging will make it more difficult for road, you know, will, will, will tip the balance back away from road towards public transport. Yeah. Now the second question he had was, you know, that one, the token tax. I get this a lot, which is a tax on financial transactions because of the national um, you know, And why? Because the main reason is every constituency in the world has to do it to begin with, otherwise I'll conduct all my transactions and the one that doesn't have a tax. That's the most obvious um, objection to it. And B, it slows down all transactions, not just those that you might regard as frivolous or speculative or somehow evil. It slows everything down. Now why on earth would you want to put that sort of impost onto people's lives and the economy? So there's just better ways to do it. Um, as a teacher, I'm really concerned that you're going to start young people. I'm worried that there's going to be a whole generation that's going to down. Could you say you're going to start at the early childhood stage? But they've already got school and high school and, and across the road here um, teaching a generation. And are they going to miss out because you're only going to concentrate on? No. Okay, so the question is about education, basically, where does it hit? And the answer is right through the chain. But there's different approaches to each part of the chain. So let's just start with, I've already mentioned the first one, which was the kids getting to school at age five, two years behind. They will never ever make that up. So we have to invest at that end. We have to give equal, I care what your income is, equal access to quality early education for children, kids, grand, four year olds. Mum and dad in this modern society are so bloody busy out there working their guts out to pay the rent or the mortgage, they haven't got enough time for Johnny and Jenny to get the same education, the same my um, family would be good and rich. So that is just not on. So we have to go back to um, an early childhood education, high quality and available for all. I'm going to deal with something on that on Tuesday. Second part is schools, but to uni. Because policy offering we have there is getting rid of testing. Apart from the testing that's required by the teacher to understand how Johnny and Jenny are proceed through the system. The problem with testing in New Zealand is it's being overcooked by the because of the vanity of parents, mm -hmm. right, and their own insecurity. It is pathetic. These teachers need to get their fingers out of it because all this testing is doing is giving them less time to educate these children. So less time for the teachers to do it, less education for the children. It's completely counterproductive. Go and have a look at the Scandinavian model of education. And they beat us every time in the PISA. Um, they're just better at it. We're not that bad. But, you know, they're just better. There's just better ways. So that's the school thing. Well, the other thing with the schooling section is stopping the uh, unnecessary, well, the waste that really comes from having schools compete. Oh, that's a, a, a failed experiment too. No, this is, yeah, yeah. This is tomorrow's schools, like they did in the health system, gives for the cheese, right, your hospitals, you have to compete against it. I know one of you's got a scanner that's got nobody going through it, and the other one's, you know, overflowing, but you mustn't talk to each other. That'll be a breach of the Commerce Act. Um, and so, you know, let them out. Oh, that was. This is a public good, for goodness sake. It is not a private sector, you know, traded commodity. Same with education with tomorrow schools. What's happened with tomorrow schools, where they, you know, the locals form the trustees and make the decisions and all the rest of it, um, is that, and there's, you have 
Jewish tale still plays a role for people wanting to build beyond just what a UBI will provide. So I think we've seen quite good results so far from KiwiSaver, so I would like to see that disappear. Um, it's pretty modest KiwiSaver in New Zealand by a city Australia model, so I wouldn't be going near that at this stage. Right, that's the end. Should we do some quick fires, like, like the people that have very quick questions? Maybe we'll get them. Okay. All right, what are you going to do to help the medical The question is, what are you going to do about the medical system to make it more equal? The problem with the public health in New Zealand is the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Okay? Um, so old white guys, they get lots of money out of the system because they just create havoc by saying you're going on ZB tomorrow if you don't operate on me now. We'll take the time off now. That'd be awesome. Um, but other cultures like Polynesian and Maori people don't behave like that. They're actually better behave. So they go to the back of the So that's the first issue with it. How are you going to ration healthcare? You have to ration it. I like the Farmac model where it's done on the quality adjusted life years that result the, 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 the result of the intervention. Um, the other thing in health is we're going to spend a lot more money on prevention. Because the, all the research tells us you get four times the return by preventing this stuff than by waiting, funding the ambulance and bottom of the So you know, you have to improve and quite reducing the quality to prevention you want to look out there as well. I don't know if I'm going to go online. Um, yeah? Uh, good evening. Uh, I've got a question to see about immigration, which is not mentioned yet. The words of a great deleted musician called Luke Hurley, uh, who turned six this year, is there is a nation on the verge of war, so many millions at the door. We can sing songs or we can drop bombs. Make room, make room. What's your response to this great refugee crisis in the world? I'm wrong. No, no, no. When it comes to refugees, it's, it's the same as economic migrants, actually, but it's obviously refugees that's far more serious. Um, the supply from a New Zealand perspective is infinite. We're only a small country. Right, well, it's, you know, it's more GDP than it is. Yeah. However, given that constraint, the numbers that we take in are abysmally low, and we need to get to um, at least average practice and actually better practice than average. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking about voluntary, you know, rep uh, repatriation of refugees, not getting your borders swamped, which is a different. You know, but even on that issue, I've, been, I've just been in Palestine and up on the front of Lebanon and Syria, and our reputation up there is atrocious, us and Australia. So we have a lot of ground to make up on this. Now, you know, let's just get refugees in proportion to total migration. Here's total migration coming into New Zealand, there's refugees. Right? It's only about whatever it is, 1,000 to 2,000, and total is 70,000. Okay. We've got a major problem with um, human, uh, economic migration, huge problem. Far too many of them. Um, the issue with migration is, economic migration now I'm talking about, is you must add to the living standards of New Zealanders, otherwise why? The supply is infinite, again. And so that's why I'm looking at increasing the quality of these migrants, which means the dough over here, so they put into your coffee and the tax they save you by charging them double the rate on the land they own and making sure that any foreigner that comes here and gets their um, permanent residency becomes a New Zealand taxpayer on all their beneficial world income, just the same as in America. You cannot two time Peter Till. <laughs> and I've got another thing on that. I mean, I'm pretty concerned about this foreign payment, actually. We'll, we'll do a release on it. Yeah, you know, I've got some pretty rich mates overseas, and a few of them were with me the other week. We're going for the ticket tour of the country. And so we were down in Melbourne, and then a few days later we were up in uh, Black Rock. On both occasions, you know, Joe and I might wander off down the school to see what's there, you know, if we're bored. They'd come back with a farm edge. <laughs> come on two or three farms during their three weeks here. The money is nothing. To them. Well, I don't mind them doing that, but they will be paying twice the one and a half percent. And it won't be just on the equity, it will be on the full capital. Mm -hmm. 
everyone voted. When Bolchak won that election, on the Friday they did polls that said it's going to be a 1% New Zealand uh, uh, Labour victory. Went to the polls, next day, 1% um, national. Went back to exactly the same voters on the Monday. What the hell happened? 30% have changed their mind in the last 24 hours. Welcome to the political world. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of practicalities, www.top.org.nz become, uh, you know, sign up for emails, become a member. Uh, William, up the back, give us a wave, William, has, uh, has a, um, a tablet and there's another one. Is there somewhere in the home? You've got two? No, I've got one. Yeah, there's two. Oh, there's oh, 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 There's an honest person. Uh, so, uh, come, and, come and see me. You can register or you can go to the website. Um, or we're going to go where? We're going to the captain's okay. table. We're going to the clock. And there's just one more thing. When, when we got here and we asked for volunteers from the Legion, um, that's him. That, that, and he's a lovely man. He's been with us now for three weeks and I've been conversing with him over the phone. If any of you would like to be volunteers to help get some messages out there, we would love that. And he would, and you, whoever wants to do it, would become a group and you'd get together and then we would give you resources, you know, uh, all questions. And of course, where's the badges? This could be a badge giveaway day. Lovely. Up the back as you go, we made a limited edition of 1,200,000 badges. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they are. And just to give you an idea, we or in a conversation that you sit at your next golf game, we're one of those. So as you go tonight, we hope, we hope you'll get one of these. We, we hope that you might even give your name to uh, William up there, or you can contact me through, uh, it's nick at top, not all dot but just go online, you'll see us all there. Other than that, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for giving us your time. And wow, we are blown away by the meeting and the way you conduct yourself in a political meeting. <laughs> and we hope that we'll come back really soon, and we will, and we'll hold a meeting again. We just might need a slightly bigger place, which is marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>